we'll be looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we know from our previous studies that all the electromagnetic waves, we already recognize one of them, and that's visible light. It turns out, though, that there are more sorts of electromagnetic waves than just light. This image, for example, is taken with the infrared type of electromagnetic wave, and then has been mapped to visible light. So this is not, in fact, a picture taken with visible light, but an image taken using a different kind of electromagnetic wave. Now, visible light, as it turns out, makes up only a small section of the electromagnetic spectrum. They tend to have a particular wavelength, based on their frequency, of course. And for visible light, this is between 700 nanometers and 400 nanometers. Now, how big is a nanometer? Well, if you remember your SI prefixes, you'll remember that one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So that means that waves of light have a very, very short wavelength indeed, especially compared to, for example, the sound waves. So we can see that we have red, the long wavelength end, and violet at the short wavelength end. From this picture, we can see that in between red and violet, we have all the other different colors, ranging from orange, green, blue, that sort of thing. All other electromagnetic waves are not visible. They will have a wavelength longer than 700 nanometers or shorter than 400 nanometers, and we cannot detect them with our eyes. It turns out that we have a large number of different elements on the electromagnetic spectrum, or a large number of different types of waves. And we can see that summarized in this diagram over here. In this diagram, we go from very large wavelengths to very small wavelengths. And this corresponds, of course, to very low frequencies and very high frequencies. Going from long wavelength to short wavelength, we have radio waves, which is anything longer than a few centimeters. We have microwaves, which tend to have a maximum wavelength of a couple of centimeters, and which get shorter wavelength as we go further down. Once we start getting to very short wavelengths of microwaves, we start calling the electromagnetic waves infrared light. And as you can see, these will have quite a small wavelength, especially with respect to the microwave. Beyond that, at about 10 to the minus 7 meters, we have visible light. And this is all of the electromagnetic waves that we can see with our eyes. As you can see, they range from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Just as we had infrared before we got to red, we have a different sort of violet once we get to shorter wavelengths, and that's called ultraviolet. This is, of course, one of the types of electromagnetic radiation that gets to us from the sun. Of course, it can cause sunburn. Now, once we get to very short wavelength ultraviolet rays, we end up turning into X-rays, can be used to image bones. And this is because they have such high energy that they can pass straight through soft tissue and be detected on the other side. Once we get to very short wavelength X-rays, we can start calling them gamma rays. Now, it turns out that gamma rays are the most, are the shortest wavelength, rather, electromagnetic waves that it's possible to get. Anything with a wavelength shorter than this sort of area, 10 to the minus 11, is automatically classified as a gamma wave. All of these wavelengths put together are called the electromagnetic spectrum. So the spectrum consists of all the different sorts of waves. We can call these waves a number of different things. We can call them electromagnetic waves. We can call them electromagnetic radiation. Or we can call them by their individual parts of the spectrum, whether it's visible light, X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, radio waves, whatever. So how does the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave relate to the amount of energy it carries? Well, as I'm sure you can guess, radio waves have a fairly low amount of energy, whereas ultraviolet and X-rays have a fairly high amount of energy. So we can see that EMA waves with higher frequencies, that is, shorter wavelengths, will have more energy than those with lower frequencies. So radio waves have the lowest energy of any electromagnetic radiation, and gamma rays have the highest energy of any electromagnetic radiation. So how do we create low energy electromagnetic waves? Well, we take an electron and we wiggle it back and forth. This will create low frequency radio waves or microwaves. Remember that microwaves have a wavelength of a few centimeters. So all we need to do to create waves like this is take electrons and wiggle them back and forth very fast. It turns out that we're not able to do this for higher energy electromagnetic waves simply because we can't shake the electron fast enough. So this means that we can't vibrate them fast enough to produce higher energy EM waves or electromagnetic waves. So if we want to create light, or X-rays, or gamma rays, or something else like that, we'll have to find a different way to do it. Higher energy waves, like light and X-rays, are in fact also produced by electrons, but in a different way 
what happens is that an electron, while it is still inside an atom, will change the amount of energy that it has. The electron only moves inside the atom. It does not, in fact, wiggle back and forth in a conducting antenna, like for a radio wave or a microwave. Gamma rays produce differently to either of these other methods, and they are, in fact, a certain type of nuclear radiation. A nuclear reaction is a reaction that only takes place in the nucleus of an atom. So without the atom interacting with other atoms, only the nucleus acting. Of course, nuclear radiation is responsible for building things like nuclear power plants or nuclear bombs. And so gamma rays are one way that the nucleus of an atom can emit energy. Now, it turns out that most of the sun's electromagnetic radiation, most of the electromagnetic waves that it emits, don't actually ever reach Earth. They get blocked in the way here. They're either blocked by air or ozone, or things like water vapor or carbon dioxide, because all of these are able to block different electromagnetic waves, just like most of the matter that we know is able to block visible light. So the fact that a lot of radiation is blocked by our atmosphere makes it a bit safer for people living down here on the ground. Now the uppermost layer of our atmosphere, called the ionosphere, is able to reflect certain types of radio waves, but it also absorbs very high energy radiation. So the high energy radiation that it's able to absorb include gamma rays, as well as x-rays, which as you remember have a slightly less energy than gamma rays, and certain wavelengths of ultraviolet light, which as you can recall, quite similar to x-rays. So all of these are absorbed by the upper atmosphere, and they wreak havoc with the free radicals and oxygen and nitrogen up there, but they don't affect us on the ground, which is handy. These types of electromagnetic waves have so much energy that they can be dangerous and damaging if we are exposed to them. The radio waves that are reflected from the atmosphere are not quite as damaging, but it turns out that this reflecting property of the atmosphere is useful for different reasons. So I've mentioned gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet light. Are those the only types of electromagnetic radiation that are blocked by the atmosphere? Well, no, there are a few more types. In the stratosphere, ozone, a chemical made out of oxygen, absorbs most of the ultraviolet light that's still remaining, that hasn't been absorbed yet. A small amount of it still reaches the Earth, but it's far less than if it didn't go through the ozone. As it turns out, the carbon dioxide in the air, as well as the water vapor, which, as we know, is responsible for the formation of clouds, are able to absorb infrared light. So that means that infrared light doesn't get to the ground quite as much as the remaining wavelengths. So what's left? We've reflected some radio waves, we've absorbed infrared light, and we've absorbed the very high energy waves. It's ultraviolet as well as x-rays and gamma rays. We don't actually have much light left or much electromagnetic waves left by the time it reaches the ground. In fact, only visible light and radio waves can get all the way through the atmosphere without being blocked or absorbed. There are small amounts of the other types of waves that get through, but they aren't quite as large as the huge portion of visible light and radio waves. The gamma rays and x-rays are almost entirely absorbed by the upper atmosphere and most of the ultraviolet is absorbed by either the upper atmosphere or the ozone in the stratosphere. Then we have a small window where we have visible light that doesn't get absorbed at all. After that, we've got infrared and microwave light getting absorbed by water vapor and carbon dioxide in the air, followed by another gap of radio waves. Once the radio waves get to a long enough wavelength, however, they start being reflected from the atmosphere. So it turns out that because the upper atmosphere absorbs gamma rays and x-rays, they never reach the ground and we're safe from them. If you expose someone to ultraviolet light or even worse, x-rays or gamma rays for a very long time, you can cause a lot of damage and burning. If we want to see other wavelengths of light, such as are emitted by our sun or stars, then we can't actually set up a telescope on the surface of the Earth. Because if we look up, we won't see any gamma rays or x-rays. They'll all be absorbed by the upper atmosphere. If we want to see what a star looks like in the x-ray or the gamma ray spectrum, then we need to build a telescope out in space and then use it. And of course, this is why we have things like the Hubble Space Telescope or the SOHO Solar Observatory that observes our sun in different wavelengths. So this is the end of the theory. We've learned a bit about all the different kinds of electromagnetic wave and which ones of them can reach the surface from the sun. Let's go on to some questions. Question six, a certain beam of red light has a wavelength of 650 nanometers. What is its wavelength in meters? Remember that one nanometer is equal to one billionth of a meter. In scientific notation, one nanometer equals 10 to the power of minus nine meters. So how can we convert this 10 to the minus nine into an answer here? As you can see, there aren't any minus nines. The trick is that we have not six nanometers, but 650. So we're multiplying 6.5 times 10 to the two by this number. 
we have 1 nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, 650 nanometers will be 6.5 times 10 to the 2, that is 650, times 10 to the minus 9 meters, which gives us, of course, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Question 7. Which of these options has the most energy? We'll start off at the bottom radio waves. Now it turns out that anything below a certain frequency or above a certain wavelength, if you want to put it like that, is counted as a radio wave. So these have the least energy because they have the least frequency. Anything with a wavelength of more than a few centimeters is classified as a radio wave, no matter how long its wavelength may be. The next most powerful is microwaves. These have more energy than radio waves generally, but in fact, low energy microwaves, that is microwaves with long wavelengths, are exactly the same thing as radio waves with short wavelengths. So these might be on the neighborhood, in the neighborhood of a, a centimeter or two. You could either say that an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength of five centimeters is a very high energy radio wave or a very low energy microwave. Moving up to higher energies and making a few jumps and bounds, we'll end up at ultraviolet light. Now in between microwaves and ultraviolet light, we have infrared light and visible light, both of which have more power than microwaves, but less power than ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light has more energy than infrared or visible light, but it doesn't have the most energy out of all these options because there's one that I haven't got to. And that is of course, X-rays. The only electromagnetic waves with more energy than X-rays are called gamma rays. And that's not one of the options. Our only answer then is B, X-rays. Remember though, that if we get a very high energy X-ray, it's pretty much identical to a very low energy gamma ray. Question eight, some wavelengths of radio wave emitted by the sun never reach the surface of the earth. Why is this? We know that they're not absorbed by carbon dioxide or water because that only happens to infrared and microwaves. And we know that they're not absorbed by the upper atmosphere because that only works for very high energy radiation and radio waves are very low energy radiation. So the answer is in fact, that they reflect from the upper layer of the atmosphere. They just bounce off and never reach the ground. So this means that rather than being absorbed or passing through, they'll bounce off the top. And in fact, if we fire a radio wave like this from the surface of the earth, we can bounce it off the ionosphere and it will come straight back down, which can be quite useful. Other radio waves, of course, are able to pass through the atmosphere without being reflected. And a great deal of them will reach the surface unimpeded. Question nine. What chemical in the atmosphere absorbs ultraviolet light and why is it important? Our answer here is of course that ultraviolet light is absorbed by the ozone layer. So the chemical that absorbs ultraviolet light is called ozone. If you're a chemist, then you might know that it happens to have the chemical formula O3, which is a bit different to normal oxygen gas. Normal oxygen gas will have O2 as its chemical formula. So we can see that they're similar. In fact, they behave very differently. The main difference between them is of course that ozone is much better at absorbing ultraviolet light. Now, why is this important? What would happen if we didn't have any ozone? The ultraviolet light wouldn't be blocked at all and it would just reach us sitting down here on earth, which is not a good thing. Ultraviolet light has a lot of energy compared to visible light, for example. And so it can cause things like sunburn or skin cancer. So without the ozone layer, it'd be a lot more dangerous to go outside. And this is of course why we're so worried about the ozone layer in environmental science. It turns out that there's a man-made chemical called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, you can probably learn more about them in chemistry, that is very very good at getting rid of all the ozone and turning it back into regular molecular oxygen, which cannot absorb ultraviolet light. So in fact as a result of these there's a very large hole in the ozone layer over the north and south poles of the earth. And at these locations, the amount of ultraviolet light that reaches the surface from the sun is far greater than in areas that are closer to the equator. Question 10. X-rays and gamma rays sometimes have similar levels of energy, but physicists distinguish between them because they're created in different ways. So how are they created? Well, think back. What was the difference between X-rays and gamma rays? The answer is that X-rays are produced by electrons, but gamma rays are not. Gamma rays are the product of nuclear reactions that occur in the nucleus of radioactive atoms. They tend to have more energy than X-rays. If we get certain type of radioactive material that emits a lot of gamma rays, we say that it is emitting gamma radiation. What about X-rays then? It turns out that X-rays are produced by rapidly changing the energy of an electron. So we can do this with a device called an X-ray tube. These are of course a bit cheaper to get than pieces of radioactive material and they last longer. And because X-rays have a lower energy, they are also a little bit safer than gamma rays. Although of course, still dangerous if you're exposed to them for too long. Well, that's the end of the questions. 
Well, we've covered the electromagnetic spectrum in this lesson. That's radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays and gamma rays in the order of least power to most power. In the next section, we'll be talking a little bit more about the electromagnetic spectrum, but more in the context of how to detect different types of electromagnetic wave.